Hello again, welcome back to our 5 Reasons video series. Today we would like to give you 5 reasons for the permanent progress in linguistics. And as usual, I have someone with me here who can talk about the reasons much better than me. It's Christian Meyer from Freiburg University, one of Germany's leading linguists, well known for his achievements in using and developing linguistic corpora, and this is the context in which we met as head of the Clarin Consortium's working group on foreign language philologies. Welcome, Christian. Well, thanks, Jürgen, for having me, and I'm looking forward to this interview experience. Great pleasure. Uh, as usual, I will not introduce um, our guest any further. Just Google his name and you will find him straightforwardly. But just in case, here behind us is his website. Now, Christian, before we talk about the five reasons for this permanent progress in linguistics, let me ask you a personal question. What was your motivation? What was the main trigger for you to become a linguist? Well, interesting question, Jürgen. I would say it was an interest in foreign languages in school and foreign languages in their social and cultural context. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed trying out Italian on the family holiday. And in university, I was sort of torn between the literature and uh, linguistics components. And uh, through a number of accidents, I drifted into English linguistics. And I emphasize English linguistics because mm -hmm. I guess for me, linguistics, interest in languages, and interest in foreign languages go together. So I can't see myself mm -hmm. as a linguist researching my own language. I see myself as somebody working on a foreign language. That's okay. part of it for me. Okay, so that sounds interesting. But let's now discuss your main points for the permanent progress in linguistics. But one thing that, that comes to my mind is that there are always charismatic people who, who are driving forces in the field. Is that true? Yes, you've identified one of several causes. The genius linguist, the charismatic innovator introducing new concepts which help us mm -hmm. see the entire field differently, uh, take a different view of language and so mm -hmm. on. And uh, I would add that sometimes you would be tempted to say that the genius innovators, the genius innovators are also marketing geniuses of a kind. Something I guess if you look at yeah. Desaussure, his book uh, wasn't published, his foundational book, yeah. uh, Cours de Linguistique Générale, wasn't published until 1916, three years after his death. Mm. His fame probably um, emerged only decades after yeah, his death. Yeah. But if you look at Chomsky, I guess, um, you would say that he became famous, rightly famous, for his conceptual yeah. innovations in his lifetime. Mm. And I would say he hasn't been among the worst marketers no, uh, of his wrong. own ideas, certainly not. Yeah, I can confirm this. I work together with Bill Labov and can fully subscribe to your view. He's a charismatic linguistic force and a bundle of energy. And an energetic yeah, worker yeah. at 80 years old. Yes. I but today we don't only have linguistic leaders. We have the global community. Part of them are watching perhaps now, hopefully. So yeah, I is guess that the driving force too? Yeah, I suppose uh, there is the phenomenon of crowd intelligence in academic linguistics as well. I mean, if you study the history of structuralism, you end up at uh, the uh, overpowering founding father, Ferdinand de Saussure. If you study generative linguistics, you end up, uh, the, the history of generative linguistics, you end up at uh, Chomsky's revolutionary books of the mm -hmm. 1950s and 1960s. Yeah. If you have a look at usage-based linguistics, at linguistic typology, I guess you would be able to point out individual scholars who've made significant contributions, but you would not arrive at one single founding mm. figure. Mm. So yeah. let's take um, functional typology. The paradigm emerged in opposition to formal approaches. Many people at various times were unhappy with the relatively dogmatic understanding of certain things in formalist approaches to language. And they accumulated the basis on which to formulate an alternative paradigm. And so you would say many parents, mm -hmm. many founding mm -hmm. figures, mm -hmm. but not a single yeah. powerful And, and today what, what figure. we experience, of course, with the YouTube videos like this one, we are permanently checked by the global community. Everything is scrutinized and, and 
criticized, evaluated, but there's constructive criticism. The community has become much larger. Okay, there is review. Yeah. So I guess, let me take the devil's advocate's point okay, of view. Yes. Let me take uh, the conservative position, at least for the sake of argument. What we need in the linguistic community is informed peer review in a democratic research culture. Yeah, yeah. And I want to stress that there's a lot of review on the web. Yes. Uh, there's a lot of comment on the web, but, but sometimes it, some uh, of it is by peers, and yes. I'm happy to accept any yeah. student who's got something to say as my peer if they have reasonable arguments for their yeah. point of view. But we should also emphasize yeah. the informed and the peer in the review, and yeah. I think we should have a little more inf of the informed and of the peer on okay, the web. Okay. But anyway, you, you're right. Yeah. It's, you, you're describing the way things are going. Okay. Let's uh, slightly change topic for a moment. Couldn't we say that linguistic progress is also a consequence of a permanent repositioning of linguistics in the concept of academic disciplines? Yeah, that's the third reason, I think. Um, when linguistics emerged, it was part of an undertaking referred to as philology, the study of texts, the study of mm. literary texts. Um, and uh, this strong alliance, I think, has informed linguistics for a very long time. It's beginning to be questioned these days. We need new alliances with psychology, psycholinguistics, mm. cognitive yeah. science. Yeah neurolinguistics, the study of, of course, the brain. It, yeah. And I would say, if you ask me where I expect great progress in linguistics over the coming 10 or 20 years, I would point to neuroscience as one area. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're just beginning to unravel the mysteries yeah, yeah. of how language is stored, mm -hmm. processed in the human brain, brain. in the human mind. Yeah. And uh, we'll find out more about that than I'm expecting with all due reserve and caution, breakthroughs in this area, which might be comparable to the discovery of uh, the common origin of all the Indo-European mm -hmm. languages mm -hmm. in the proto-language, the yeah. great insight of yeah. 19th century mm -hmm. historical comparative linguistics. Uh, factor number four is not just uh, the academic context, which we just talked about, it's the wider social mm -hmm. context. One of the ideological reasons for the flowering of linguistics in the 19th century was clearly the rise of nationalism. You had the study of the privileged three sacred languages of the Bible and interest in European mm. vernaculars, their history, interest in contemporary dialects, non-standard varieties mm. of languages, was really considered an eccentric and marginal interest in the 18th century. In the 19th century, in a climate of nationalism, uh, romantic nationalism, not the vicious kind which has plagued so much of more recent history, certainly provided a climate in which the study of older forms of the European vernaculars, Old English, Old High mm -hmm. German, was encouraged. Young people were interested in that kind of thing. University funders were willing to establish professorships. And that kind of alliance has uh, certainly disappeared. I mean, linguists who mm -hmm. work on languages today would resent the notion of being considered romantic mm -hmm. nationalists. Mm -hmm. And I guess there are areas like language and feminism, language and education, uh, discrimination in the educational system against linguistic minorities, which, um, especially in applied linguistics context, uh, are very important and if we could raise more interest in the among the general public that the work w which is being done in linguistics has many useful applications in education in language planning mm. then this could be a new alliance which would probably encourage uh, governments to reinvest in linguistics, yeah. in a yeah. different kind of yeah. linguistics, okay, yeah. but yeah. there is scope for that. Mm. So I would say distinguish between the wider social context mm. where developments go on, uh, which might be interesting, and the academic context, which is our day-to-day -day okay. environment. Yeah. Uh, we talk to our colleagues in literature, yeah. in psychology all the time. 
we compete for the same kind mm -hmm. of funding for the same resources in the university. Okay. So having mentioned four reasons already, let's finally talk about technology, one of uh, your research areas and our research areas. What about the shift from pen and uh, pencil and paper to modern technology? Isn't that the final driver or the ultimate driver even? That today? is the important driver which always works together with all the other four factors which we mentioned and which is probably more important than we generally tend to think. Mm -hmm. In academia we tend to think of achievement as the idea in the individual's mind. Mm -hmm. But if you think about uh, sound recording and research on the spoken language you will instantly see that there are many interesting branches in contemporary linguistics mm -hmm which would be impossible without a tape recorder or some kind of uh, smaller digital recording device. Discourse analysis without the recording of spontaneous Please, conversation, impossible. Yeah. Sociolinguistic variationism without uh, sociophonetics, socio without recording yeah. of sound data, yeah, absolutely impossible. impossible. Yeah. So the mobile recording device, which could be used in the yeah. field, has expanded the horizon of linguistic inquiry more enormously. Corpus analyses and all that right. stuff. Right. Usage-based yeah. linguistics, yeah. statistical approaches mm. to language require the easy availability of large masses of digital yeah. Yeah. language data. I mean, we're doing an interview, audiovisual, multimodal. Mm. I mean, can you think of uh, research on gesture, uh, facial expression, body language mm. in relation to language, yeah. communication in the round, so to speak, without audiovisual recording? Yeah. No. So I guess we're not any cleverer than the geniuses that have worked in the field before us, certainly not. We stand, as the proverb has it, on the shoulders of giants. Yeah. But what we do have is the technical tools which enable us to ask questions which the people before mm -hmm. us couldn't ask because they would have known that compiling a concordance to the works of Shakespeare was years of work. Yeah. For us now in the digital era, it's one afternoon's work. Not minutes, but hours, right. but it's yeah. short. Okay, so Christian, I'm sure you could go on and on, um, but we have to stop because our policy is to be as uh, concise as possible. So we confine ourselves to five reasons. On behalf of all our viewers, thank you very much for being with us. I'm okay. looking forward to seeing this on the <laughs> web. <laughs> thanks, <laughs> thanks for your statements and all the best for your futures. Thanks thank you very much. Uh, okay.